then we are moving ahead to a panel. Now, since we've been having some difficulties, we're bringing Arun and Flavio back on. Um, if things don't work and you aren't able to ask Olaf your questions, please stay in the chat and hope and, and continue. Um, I'm going to ask the first question. So it was actually one that was inspired by, well, first of all, in my history with APIs, I tend to I'm just sure always say, don't talk about I APIs. It's my, my job to answer a question in this uh, panel. So I always say in my history in the API space, uh, don't talk about APIs, talk about what they do, what they can accomplish. Um, because I think application programming interface sounds very fierce and technical to the rest of the audiences. And as Olaf said, that was wonderful. We should never call a developer portal a developer portal because it's really a business enabler. It's not just a tool for developers anymore. When anything, when we're abstracting something, we should move away from those highly technical Kubernetes orchestration type terminology that is a bit nervous to those of us from the less technical or atechnical side. So I thought a good question to start and then Arun and then Flavia, if you want to go first and second, uh, how do you define APIs and API management to other parts of the business? And don't use the word API in the definition. Arun, you can go first then Flavio, please. Sorry, Jennifer, I did not get the question right. So uh, how, can you repeat it? When you're, when you're talking with business partners, how do you define APIs? How do you define API management? without using the word API? How do you explain their value? Uh, the, the value is pretty simple, right? The value is more in terms of um, how they can interact with us uh, without, uh, in, in pure technical terms. They don't have to uh, talk to anyone, uh, but the technology talks to the other technology using something uh, called an API. That's, that's the best definition that I can give it for now. Uh, okay, then I can go, I think. Um, yeah, that, that is the 1 million euro question, right? It's, uh, it's not easy to talk about APIs without saying APIs. Uh, we, we try to focus on the digital business, business capabilities and explain about the digital transformation using interfaces and the connectivity, uh, enabling connectivity across departments in the company and uh, how they can leverage from each other knowledge, right? And uh, for, for example, we talked before about the customer having the right information if the flight is delayed or if something happens. That's the use cases we try to bring to explain, okay, you have this digital capability here that can help you bring better value to the customers that you are responsible for. It's beautiful digital capability, though digital again sounds a bit hashtaggy. But that yeah. brings more value to the customer. Yeah, that's the whole agile mindset, right? Olaf? Let's see if this works. Okay, I'm reading the, the question. Um, thanks. Um, well, we are, um, besides that we are from the, the um, IT department, we are um, mostly also with a very business focus. And I, I'm with Mercedes-Benz for more than 20 years, and I, I pass lots of business area. So um, it's um, it's not new. So to, um, as we also deal um, or interact with dealers, they all have this business perspective. So that it's not it's not a hurdle for us. What is new that there is um, from the internal organization, and normally other areas are in in, in touch with the dealers, and now the the new organization with deals with the data products are also in touch with the dealers so it's more uh and, and something that we have to align better internally and create more transparency absolutely i think we need a lot of transparency i heard recently the statement i forget the i can't attribute because i forget where it came from but that the ceo should always have the cto up on stage with them because they bring a lot of so much value at this point. So we need to be talking about the digital transformation and the IT behind the business because they are equal pillars to holding up any business now. 
So I just had a question for everyone and Flavio, you can start. How has your roadmap changed or evolved? I've heard that cloud computing anywhere from 30% to 60% rapid migration to the cloud has happened because of the crisis and pandemic we've happened. How has your roadmap pivoted? Uh, well, uh, you might have heard about something called COVID uh, recently. Uh, yeah, that, that impacted a lot, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's in the news. It, all airlines are basically stopped. So obviously in terms of costs, we had to go into a huge amount of efforts uh, everywhere. And yeah, IT is definitely uh, in the spotlight. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's many old systems that are still around. And, uh, and many of those need to be reviewed. And you mentioned Agile, also uh, more uh, work between different teams to try to collaborate and, uh, and bring more digital solutions uh, and cheaper solutions. Cheaper is always a key word uh, to, to the customer. So the roadmap is constantly evolving. <laughs> the roadmap was evolving anyway, fair enough. Olaf, do you wanna answer that question now? About how your roadmap has changed at Mercedes-Benz? Okay, Arun, do you wanna answer first? Okay, uh, I mean, uh, just just like how Flavio mentioned, we are, we are on the other side of the airline, right? So we are the providers for the airline. So uh, I would probably put this in a very positive way, right? Uh, to say this gave us an opportunity to uh, fix a lot of things that we have not had time to do it, right? I mean, every airline wants to, every airline, every customer wants to go super fast. And that sort of means we sort of build a lot of technical debt over a period of time, right? Uh, but this is like uh, uh, an opportunity where we could fix a lot of those things, right? Uh, but that's one part of it. On the second part of the roadmap, I would say this also helps uh, step back and think on what the future is, right? Uh, it's it's about cloud. It's about um, how how do we interact with uh, customers better, yeah. what 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 are the different alternate opportunities that we can provide as solutions like contactless, uh, biometrics, et cetera, which all took a whole lot of time in the past to adopt, but now uh, uh, it's gonna be easy. I mean, I, I can take a simple example. Schools were the last thing that we would say, say they can be digital, right? Uh, now, if you think all schooling is digital. Uh, so similarly, I think the adoption has been rapid. And I think the next two, three years will be a bigger spike up in terms of technology adoption than what we saw in probably the last 10 to 15 years. I hope so. We'll see, because I don't think it really worked that well with schools, but we'll see how it goes. Hola. <laughs> I like this way your uh, panel discussion. And by the way, hi, Flavio and uh, Arun. Nice to meet you, even though I can't see you. So the question is about uh, how the pandemic accelerated this, the stuff at our end. Um, mostly, uh, we are really pushing forward digital um, transformation, which are, we're all already on, on the on the timeline, but uh, there is really an acceleration. So especially if we have the, the on and offline topic, so the, the customers uh, go out to the retailer, which is not possible at this point of time, they need more engagement on the online offer. So the seamless um, customer experience and, and a switch between offline and online, this is where, uh, where one of our focus points currently is and will be the, the next few years. I've seen um, only some some retailers who completely set up a virtual showroom so that really the, the users walk around and it's not like a website, it's really more like a virtual um, where you can walk around and you can have then uh, direct uh, talks and zoom calls with the with the uh, salesman and, and the others working on, on the on the retailer side so i also see that probably this will um, push very much from all kind of um, not only from mercedes-benz but all from the other oems as well Absolutely. And we'll see how long it lasts because we know part of it is that crises push innovation. So we have to see what happens. Um, 
so framework okay. yeah we we um fully follow the uh, follow the the open api specification and and i can just let's say share share the the, the way how i operate uh, how or i how i work on my my new product we really um focus on contract first an api really provides a stable contract and as soon or as fast as you have defined the contract and also um, aligned with, with the first runner um, or forerunner customers, um, the better the effect will be. So we, we have really defined the new specs aligned with external um, partners. So with some of the dealers, we really gave valuable feedback. And then both on our end as well on, as on, on the dealer side, they can start implementing the stuff. So this is more the, the philosophy contract first stick on this and as soon as you are ready with your product you have the first partners who have done their integration and and can start using the api so the the revenue itself um you or you see the revenue very very early if you just end up with the product and and, and launch it and then um, tell it to others then all the potential customers they start integration of the new api which will take a few months so you really lose time so um, contract first is one uh, how you can really speed up or that, that you receive um, some revenue. So Olaf was talking about answering the great audience question about how seriously do you take API product management, creating new APIs? Do you follow any kind of methodology or framework? And Olaf, of course, was talking about following the contract first method. So Arun, what happens over at Amadeus? Yeah, so it's, uh, I would say, sort of very similar, uh, Jennifer. The, the, uh, when I say the API first mindset, right, I can give you an example of the product that I, I gave in the uh, use case uh, during my presentation. The, uh, the UI is never discussed. Uh, the, uh, the back, sort of the uh, main business context and the APIs are developed first. Uh, the UI comes as a afterthought. Right. Uh, if if you are building APIs in a very strong, secure way, the uh, the UI is just uh, a sm one channel to interact with it, and not the first channel to interact with it. Uh, I understand this is probably working for a more uh, working well for a more B two B kind of a solution. B two C probably uh, would be a little different, but at least the mindset is build the APIs first. Test it, test it for stability, ensure that it works, and then sort of step into the UI layer and make the usability around it. So that's that's sort of been the uh, process or the methodology, I would say. And similarly, when I'm looking at for an external APIs, um, I think both Flavio, in fact, Ola, Flavio, and even Amadeus, uh, the, the, the bit is uh, the organizations are becoming far more open. Uh, you're providing APIs for others to consume and build products around it. Uh, earlier, this used to be almost impossible. It used to be more like a you build a component and then talk about integrations. Now you start with integrations and build applications over it. So that's that's probably the shift that we see. Flavia, do you want to add yeah, to yeah. that? I would say I'll say my answer is very similar to the two we already heard. Uh, we are using open API specifications, so trying to follow an API first approach, always design the API before starting doing development in the back end. Always focus focus on what the consumer needs, uh, the consumer of the API needs, and not necessarily what we have in the database. Uh, of course, in reality, we still have a lot of SOAP services that need to evolve for whatever reason. We have a lot of things around, and this is not always possible, but uh, we, we try to go with that approach as much as we can. Thank you so much, Flavio. So Arun, I was wondering uh, in your many wonderful analogies or metaphors you were using about breaking up the monolith, my favorite was seams. You started talking that you need to look for the seams where you can break up the different pieces of the monolith. So uh, how do you find those scenes? How do you break down, when you're going to break down a monolith, how do you find the, where the silos are and where you're gonna break it down and coordinate the overview, both the technical and the business use cases? I don't know. Yep, th this is an inter interesting question as always, right? So uh, this depends from application to application. 
situation to situation, right? I mean, it, it doesn't mean all applications in Amadeus have the same seams, uh, but it could be uh, it could be top down in some ways. So, for example, let's say uh, we are building the uh, login layer, which is probably common across all all different components. This could be a seam in some way uh, where we take out the login part of all the applications and then eventually have the integrations with the rest. Right? This could be sort of the top down. More of a bottom up is uh, independently, every team works on whatever is the easiest component for them to uh, break, uh, which has less impact to the customer, uh, easier to develop, gets their hands dirty into the getting into that process. It could be all, I mean, or even to go and convince the business or a customer uh, to say, look, this is an opportunity where we can start. Uh, so it's 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 almost like a show and tell if it's a bottom up approach. Absolutely, and you can always start with new features or things like that. That's super interesting. Something Flavio, I thought was interesting that you were talking about was you talked about logically that maybe things could be stable within geographic boundaries, and that originally when airlines were just basically like. At Espana or something that were just in a certain country, that that globalized space, and you need to cross those boundaries. There's differences, but how do you deal with things like GDPR and data restrictions if you're aiming to cross over these geographic boundaries? How do you do that in a safe data way? Uh, sorry, Jennifer, I didn't understand the last one minute of <laughs> the question. Sorry, it seems that my audio seemed to be going in and out. I apologize to everyone. I was just, I found it interesting when you were talking mm -hmm. about how uh, natural country to country, and then mm -hmm. um, the idea was that you then had to break out of those geographic silos. And how can you do that securely? How does the API help facilitate all of these data sharing issues that come with geographic boundaries? Uh, well, always take the worst case scenario and share as less as possible. Uh, and always with the consent of the people, uh, right? So of course, so f first of all, most of the APIs we have, they're either internal or they are with partners. So if it's a partnership, there's probably some contract uh, signed by someone who defines what data can be shared. So that's somehow the problem solved there. Uh, but now in, um, in Europe with G GDPR, we are starting to have these uh, automatic tools that you can just simply, as a customer, say, I want to share this with this application with that, uh, and, and that can just happen. Uh, but that, that happens, for example, with, uh, with the cruise. Uh, applications where you have to have an account within Lufthansa for with a specific role and you have to give your explicit consent to to have access to the information fair enough yeah that's actually how I guess it should be and especially everything has to be traceable in an API create yeah. a fingerprint and a trace audit trail. So that's wonderful. And then I wanted to ask Olaf the last okay, question. Yes, um, a question for me. Uh, uh, about privacy technology. Anonymize the data and uh, can you talk about why that's important in a part of an API strategy? Well, it's, it's not directly related to the API strategy. It's, it's a playground uh, our business or industry is involved in and it's completely new due to the um, yeah, engagement of all parties on all levels. And so making data available, um, that is from our point of view, coming from, from the car sensors gets aggregated and can now be reused or reused from, from other parties and no, no, no data alone. So no single data is kind of value. The value um, comes up when you combine it with other stuff. So from the, let's say from the EV market, from the charging industry, um, and then you have the authorities who also want to improve the uh, the met metropolitan or the traffic, even just as traffic in the cities. So um, the, the senders of cars can really identify free parking lots. They can identify in wintertime slippery road events or bad road conditions. So they can really um, create this new um, data, this new kind of data towards the public for 
platform at all, which then can be really reused by the, the other participants. This is new, so it's not really relates to the FBI strategy. What we have defined as it's important for us is that we, we operate in the mobility sector that we really set a focus and, and, and a priority on, on engaging here in this area. Absolutely. And I think while it's not part of an API strategy, if data is the new oil, then privacy is the new earth. We have to do everything we can to protect it. And privacy technology, whether it's synthetic data or anonymized data, is something every layer of an organization has to talk about because it gets back to what we were just talking with Flavio about that audibility trail. So with this, I really appreciate everyone through our technical difficulties, but it's 2021. We shouldn't have high expectations. Just hope for it to be a little better. And this was, I really learned a lot from Olaf, Flavio, and Arun, and I'm so grateful to each of you, as well as our very supportive and patient audience. So thank you, everyone. I think you have a spatial chat social to go to now to move yourself around in and have fun in a virtual venue. So take advantage of that. And good luck on your API journey. And I hope you enjoy tomorrow's API days, Helsinki and the North. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night or morning.